Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to today's Grant Thornton International Tax Webinar. Many thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, this is the latest in a series of international tax webinars that we've been running over the last couple of years. And I think as anybody who's been on any of our previous webinars will know, will know there's been no shortage of things to talk about. And I suspect today is going to be no, ex no exception. There's a lot going on, a lot going on globally at OECD level. There's a lot going on at, at EU level. We had indeed yesterday uh, the ECOFIN, the latest ECOFIN meeting, where there was an update on Pillar 2, the global minimum tax. And of course, a lot going on locally as well. And the objective of today is to bring all that together uh, in the session over the 60 minutes. Format today, if Amy, you just want to pop up the, the next slide. This is the, what we're, the way we're going to lay it out. So... Vikas Visal, Global Head of Tax, Grant Thornton International, will, if you like, do a scene setter with a global economic update, a landscape update. Delighted to have Vikas here in person live with us. That will then be followed by David Seitz, who's the Head of International Tax, Grant Thornton US, with an update on the US. Always a lot going on in the US, and I don't think this presentation is going to be any different. And then David will join me as part of a panel discussion. So I'll be moderating, David will join me. Matt Stringer in the UK, Christina Bush in Germany, Jakob Mook in the Netherlands, and Sujay Paul in India to talk about Pillar 2 and other topical tax issues. And then we'll wrap it up. We'd love to get your questions. At time permitting, we'll get to as many of them as we can. So please do use the Q&A function you'll see at the bottom of the screen. So not the chat box, but the Q&A function. And we will get to as many of the questions as possible. And we will follow up afterwards if we don't get a chance to, to address them. So without further ado, Vikas, I will hand over to you for the scene setter and the global economic update. Thank you, Peter. And a very warm welcome from my side as well to all the participants. I think uh, it's interesting to understand the current global economic scenario or the global economic narrative as we call it, in order to understand how the tax and policy regulations are shaping up across the globe, because they have a direct bearing on what we do today. And what we plan for the future as well. I think over the last uh, couple of decades, uh, we have grown up talking about the VUCA word, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and quite ambiguous. A new terminology or acronym has been coined now, and thanks to Jamias Casquio, who's an American anthropologist, author, and futurist, who coined the term BANI, which is brittle, anxious, non-linear and incomprehensible in view of the various crises which we or the world collectively is facing today. These include primarily climate change, pandemic, inequality, instability, just to name a few. So what does these actually mean for us in the business world? Brittle, which is the first one, gives us a feeling of an illusion, where on the surface of it, Things appear to be very normal, very robust. However, just beneath the surface, they are very brittle, where the entire ecosystem could collapse within a matter of few days or few months. And I will give you a few examples of what we are talking about. Second one is in context of anxious, which means anxiety. That is, there is a feeling that business leaders feel that they are not able to cope up. There is a fear of being, not being able to take the right decisions in spite of the fact there is so much of information flow. Now, right or fake, I think it's a matter of perspective. Third, the non-linear. That is, there, no, there is no direct cause and effect relationship. A development taking place in one part of the world could have a consequence or serious repercussions in a very unrelated part of the world. And we have seen in terms of the supply chain disruptions, how things change overnight. Last one, incomprehensible. One simply does not understand what's going on. Even though there is a lot of rhetoric, there is a lot of noise, but it is actually becoming very difficult to interpret. So what does all this mean for the businesses? Let's take a few examples to better understand the Bani world in which we are operating today. Friends, just a few months back, we were talking about acute shortage of manpower. There was manpower which was not available or the requisite talent was not available. Fast forward by a few months, 
Now we are seeing large scale layoffs in the tech world, in the US and the rest of the world. And that is unfortunately happening just before the beginning of the holiday season. Incomprehensible, isn't it? Why, how, and what has changed in the last few months is difficult to say and how dramatically things have changed. Another example of the Bani world, crypto world. We all know it is often linked to acute volatility, but what has happened in the recent past, which is just the last few weeks, is telling us that there is a voice which is coming from the civic society that we need more regulation surrounding it. Now, it is completely uh, averse to a situation where we are talking about no regulations in terms of this kind of an asset class, whereas now the civil society is saying we need more regulation. And it is likely that we will see regulations faster happening, keeping in view that multi-billion dollar organizations have lifted, literally got wiped out in a matter of few days. Another example, the startup world, where the money was just flowing in. Billions of dollars were getting pumped in. And the rhetoric over there was growth at any cost and customer acquisition. Let me repeat, growth and customer acquisition were the only two things based on which the valuations were there. Again, multi-billion dollar valuations. Fast forward it to the present scenario, we are talking about survival and profitability now. Now, how fast the world is changing. Another example in terms of the Bani world in which we are living is what was a norm in the developing part of the world is becoming increasingly common in the developed world as well. Let's look at the inflation, high single digit or early double digit inflations, which were a norm in the devel developing world. Now we are seeing in the developed world. Another example of that is many public sector workers going on strikes in the Western world to seek pay hikes and legislators working overnight with new regulations in order to avoid that kind of a thing happening. While the next year looks decent enough in terms of the current year, we are seeing the GDP global growth of 3.2%, which is primarily because of the pent up demand from the COVID. The next year is expected to grow at 2.7%, whereas the inflation will continue to be there. And it is not transient as we understood earlier. It is going to stay. And in certain parts of the world, we are still seeing inflation at 10% high. So these are the average figures, which are the projection. How things will shape up will only come to know as the year starts. One point I would like to highlight in context of the uncertainty is how fast the things are changing. Now, these are the projections which I have put from the IMF at the beginning of the year and every quarter, how things have changed in terms of the global GDP numbers. At the beginning of the year in 2022, the expectation was that the GDP will grow at about 4.4%. If you look at it almost on a quarterly basis, the numbers have gone down. Now, in the month of October, the projections are 3.2%. And mind it, the year is still not over. Similarly, for the next year, when we started this, uh, the projection, we expected 3.8% growth, whereas now we are talking about just 2.7 growth rate. What does this mean? Irrespective of whether we call it a slowdown or recession in different geography, the fact of the matter is that businesses have been impacted. And I will cover that in my next two slides. And businesses are acting cautious. They are trying to conserve cash and adapt to the ever-changing regulatory policies to be on the right side of the law. Interestingly, we did one survey wherein we invited inputs from the CXOs, largely from the mid-market global companies. And the results were not surprising at all. Most of the businesses are facing high inflation and high cost of doing business, whether it is in terms of fuel, energy, or transportation, or in terms of the compensation costs, everywhere we are seeing anywhere between 15% to 20% price hike. Businesses are also telling us that they are not able to pass on the entire cost to the consumers. However, it's just a matter of time when they will be forced to push these costs to the consumers, which means even higher inflation as we go along. 
So what are businesses doing currently? They are taking multiple steps, and that is what we are hearing from the business leaders across the globe. They are trying to conserve cash. They are trying to optimize on the cost. They are looking at avenues to offshore and onshore, depending on their business models. They are trying to cut down on their financial cost, and they are trying to be closer to the consumers to understand what their products or services are, and also trying to distinguish. Friends, in context of the larger economic scenario, there is a direct impact on the tax and policy framework. And I think it will not be an exaggeration to say today that tax is again at the forefront, both in terms of domestic policy making as well as in terms of international trade and commerce. If you look at what has happened recently in the UK, the mini budget that was presented and various other political reasons, it led to the change in guard at the highest levels, including the finance head over there. Now, this is the impact of tax and policy, including what is happening at the ground level in terms of the rising cost and inflation. My colleague David will soon cover what is happening on the US midterm elections because uh, they are still trying to figure it out. However, the fact is the debate which is going on right now is which are the tax policy measures which are going to sail through and which ones will be put on the back burner. Governments today are under tremendous pressure to fill in the public coffers and fill in the whole cost by the COVID. And in order to support the masses, they are putting increasing pressure on the revenue authorities to collect more taxes. And that is the overall scenario in which we are operating. Huge uncertainty, huge complexities, and newer regulations and tighter regulations being introduced. But that is what the reality is. Therefore, we need to prepare ourselves to live in this Bani world and ensure that our businesses are resilient and adapt to the ongoing tax policy changes. Let me pause over here and invite David to share his perspective. So, so what is happening on the US tax side? David, over to you. Vikas, thank you so much um, for that update. <clears throat> I gotta tell you, there were parts of that that uh, didn't sound the most upbeat. There's definitely some challenges ahead, I think, for businesses uh, in this environment. Um, so let's turn uh, to the US. You mentioned that we were uh, in the process of um, figuring out our election results. And, and obviously we held our, what we call midterms um, on November 8th. And, and during those midterm elections, every member of our House of Representatives runs for reelection and certain senators are up for reelections. Um, there was a runoff race that came out of those midterm elections, and that runoff race was actually decided last night. And so we do know now that the composition of the Senate uh, in the United States for the next two years will be a 51-49 majority in favor of the Democrats, and they will control the Senate. They will not need the tie-breaking vote. And I think that 51 number is important, um, if you all recall. During the past legislative session, there um, was one particular Democratic senator which made it difficult for Democrats to, to move legislation on a party line basis. They now at least have a cushion where they could ostensibly lose one senator um, and, and still have kind of the, the ability to move legislation. They would be in a 50-50 tie if that senator voted with the Republicans and the tiebreaker would be the vice president of the United States, uh, Kamala Harris, who's a Democrat. So, um, a little bit of cushion there. The House of Representatives has long been decided, um, and it's clearly going to be under Republican control. I guess the question is, what is that margin? And I think um, where we are right now, and if I can get my slides going here. So here is the makeup of the um, Senate and the House. Um, you can see here these slides were not updated. The election was just decided last night, but that is now a 51 uh, 49 split that runoff went in the Democratic column. And then you also see the Republicans holding 220 in the House. So what we have is we have split government um, and split government is going to impact our ability to get things done, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So let's step back. And before we talk about maybe what the future looks like, let's talk about what's done. And um, you'll all recall that um, over the past um, several months, you know, um, there's been significant legislation passed in the United States. Of course, the American Rescue Plan that was passed in response to the COVID pandemic raised um, 
uh, or um, spent two trillion dollars um, combating um, th that, and then more recently the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which was enacted as kind of the remnants of the Democratic legislative Democratic legislative agenda, um, and they did finally push this reconciliation bill over the finish line. This bill. Um, uh, raises about $740 billion um, in revenue. Um, the principal tax revenue raiser in this bill is a 15% book minimum tax. And I'll warn you all, there's a lot of 15% minimum taxes uh, kind of floating around in the ether. This one's a completely new one and different, and we'll talk about it on the next slide. There was a 1% excise tax on stock buybacks by publicly traded companies. That's long been kind of a target for Democratic lawmakers. Um, perceiving that there's some tax advantages that come with buybacks um, and that those buybacks you know, should be discouraged from a policy perspective. Um, Superfund excise taxes um, were changed. Um, that's the crude oil Superfund excise tax. Uh, that was a revenue raiser, although not as significant as the 15% book minimum tax. And then um, probably the other one to point out on here is there was an increase in IRS funding by about $80 billion, which in comparison to the previous IRS budgets is a staggering amount of money. And it's a signal that the IRS plans to become more aggressive with tax um, enforcement. Um, I think they're gonna be making heavy investments in additional technology in order to better utilize their resources. And so it'll be interesting to watch how that $80 billion rolls out, um, how that money is spent, whether that's, um, uh, increased audit rates, um, whether there's better programs for taxpayers to kind of come into compliance. That's a kind of a big lurking issue and that which I think, um, you know, clients, um, corporations, multinational corporations want to pay, pay particular attention to um, IRS activity over the next decade. Um, I think we're going to see a ramp up. And then, of course, there was um, a huge superconductor bill that was passed separately from the Inflation Reduction Act which provided significant credits um, for investments in semiconductor plants located in the United States. This bill was kind of in response to what I would call some supply chain weakness on the US side, where there was such a heavy reliance on Asian semiconductor uh, production that um, it became a policy incentive um, for the uh, US lawmakers to pull that semiconductor production back. Uh, closer to the United States and ideally within the United States. And so um, there was quite a bit of money spent uh, in that bill to achieve those objectives. Um, let's talk about this 15% book minimum tax. I mentioned um, this was the centerpiece, if you will, of the Inflation Reduction Act from a tax perspective. Again, this one raises about $313 billion. Um, and so it's an, a significant tax and it is going to touch people, but it is extremely targeted, right? It's a 15% um, book minimum tax. And we'll talk about a little bit that concept of book minimum tax, but it only applies to companies that have a billion dollars or more in net financial statement income after it's adjusted for certain things to bring it in line with tax. But think about it as your net income on your audited financial statements. If your group exceeds a billion, you're potentially subject to the 15% book minimum tax in the United States. So if you're a US multinational, your net income's a billion or more over a three year average annual, you're gonna have to run this calculation. And what this calculation does is it starts at your net income per your books and it makes certain limited adjustments, not nearly all the adjustments you'd make for a normal tax. And to the extent you end up with a book minimum tax over the regular tax that you pay, you have to pay that in to bring yourself up to that 15% mark. Um, it sounds like something that we'll talk about maybe a little bit during the panel discussion around pillar two. But I want to point out, this is not designed, nor do people believe that this is a pillar two compliant qualified domestic minimum top-up tax. That's a mouthful to say, but I want to be clear, this tax is a little bit unique and in a lot of ways does not, not align with what the pillar two regime looks like. And the reason for that was there was some legislative opposition to enacting something that looked like a pillar two tax. Um, given where we are politically in those negotiations, which we'll discuss further. 
So that's the the book minimum tax. Oh, I do want to say one other thing. Um, for foreign groups, to the extent you're a foreign group and you have um, income exceeding a billion dollars in your foreign group, the test is whether or not you have a U.S. member of your foreign group that makes up a hundred million dollars or more of that book income. And if that is the case, that U.S. part of the foreign group is subject to the 15% book minimum tax based on the U.S. company's results. So a little bit of a sleeper there for um, large groups with significant U.S. presence. You don't necessarily have to have a billion dollars of net income just in the U.S. company uh, if you're a foreign-owned group. So um, where does this leave us, right? That was what we kind of got done, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, before that, the American Rescue Plan. So where do we look now? And I think the immediate outlook is we got some things that expired at the end of 2021. Um, I highlighted probably the two most important. That's R&D expensing and 163J. Um, and 163J is our interest limitation rules. So let me explain a little bit about both of these. R&D in the United States, um, it's commonly referred to as section 174 cost. Um, of course, there's a credit associated with R&D spending, but we're talking about the deductibility, the current deductibility of R&D expenditures uh, in the United States and, and how um, Section 174 treats those. For, forever, it's been that those are currently deductible um, in the year incurred, whether or not you see benefit from the IP. And the R&D expensing provision that went into effect on January 1st, 2022, requires you now to capitalize and amortize your R&D over a five-year period, which is obviously a detriment to U.S. R&D investment, um, and uh, you know has you know kind of got businesses up in arms about why would you do this? This is not in line with the policy concerns. And so the question is, why would we do this, right? Um, and I'll come back and I'll talk about that, but I want to explain 163J first. 163J also is changing, and it is changing to make the, the, the um, uh, amount of interest that you're allowed to deduct every year. That limitation is going to be calculated by reference to earnings before interest and taxes, as opposed to earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So that number is going to become a smaller number by the depreciation and amortization margin, further pinching U.S. companies on their ability to deduct interest in kind of the worst environment. So why would we do these? And I say at the worst environment because of the rising interest rates. So why would we do these two things? Both of these provisions were embedded in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that, that President Trump's administration passed. It was a reconciliation bill. And because it was a reconciliation bill, it had to raise revenue to offset. These revenue raisers were put in. And so I kind of refer to them as ticking time bombs that sit inside this legislation. Here we are, five years later, the revenue raisers are kicking in. Can Congress deal with these? Is there going to be a bill to kind of fix R&D expensing and fix the interest limitation and some of the other things you see? It's unlikely, I think, right? I mean, we have this situation, and, and you can look at why it's so hard. It used to be that we could come together and we could go to the table and we could get a lot of um, extender legislation because there were a bunch of credits um, and things that needed to, to be funded. The Democrats were interested in a lot of the credits around uh, certain energy incentives, uh, clean energy, things that they were um, passionate about. But those things were put into the Inflation Reduction Act. And so they're permanent law already. So the Democrats have a little bit less reason to come to the table and fix these business problems that the Republicans are responsible for, right? And so I think that um, it's possible we could see a bargain, but this is really what's in front of us right now. What's going to become of R&D expensing and what's going to become of our interest limitation? So more to come on that. Let's quickly talk about beyond that the next two years and what we might expect. Um, I think that the big question for me um, in the next two years is, will Congress be able to do something about Pillar 2? I'll drop down right to the bottom of the slide. And I know, Peter, we're going to talk about that. But I think that is the big question now is, will the U.S. be able to enact anything around Pillar 2? When I started this presentation, I told you we had uh, split Congress, right? Um, in the United States, legislation needs to start in the House, which is Republican controlled. It needs to be passed in the Senate, which is democratically controlled. And I think absent a grand bargain, it's going to be hard to move legislation, right? 
So could we nibble around the edges and do some things on the tax front? Sure. Are we going to be able to muster enough support to do a significant pillar two implementation, changing our guilty provisions, changing our beat provisions, implementing a UTPR? Um, I, I don't know. It, it's a great question. I think we'll talk about it more in the panel. So I think the word from the U.S. is significant things done that people need to think about and focus on, significant things happening as a result of actions from years ago, including R&D and 163J, and a lot of uncertainty about what's really possible in this split government going forward. So um, I guess we'll all sit back and enjoy the show and wait. And I'm looking forward to talking about uh, Pillar 2, Peter, um, during the panel. Thanks for that, David. That was really good. And yeah, no, we, we, we will come back to that. And your comment around the IRS funding is very interesting. I think you had 80 billion, which you said was quite a significant number in the context of normal budgets. And I think that probably points to the amount of work we're all going to have to spend um, on tax and the additional complexity that taxpayers, advisors, and indeed revenue um, are collectively going to be facing, whether we all need it. Well, that, that's debatable, but it looks like that is what we are collectively facing for the foreseeable future. Um, and I'm going to bring in everybody else, sorry, all, all other panel members now joining us as well. Um, but David, I might just start with you just on the 15%, because it's a new provision, your 15% minimum tax. And you said what it isn't and maybe what it is. How, how does it interact with guilty, if at all? And where does it leave the, the US with Pillar 2? It's a great question. So um, it, the biggest difference between this and a Pillar 2 um, compliant qualified domestic top-up tax is... U.S. companies can get this tax back. And let me explain what that means. This is kind of an alternative minimum tax. So what happens is in year one, if your book income yields a, a, a corporate alternative minimum tax of 100 and your regular tax was only 75, you pay the 25 bucks. But three years down the line, if the situation flips and your regular tax is 100 and your corporate alternative minimum tax is only 75, you get a credit, right? So over this period of time, you're not really being brought to 15%, you know, you're being accelerated to 15%, but ostensibly you're paying the same amount of tax. That's gotta be a big problem for people, right? When you look at the qualified domestic minimum top-up tax, there's nothing in there that says, hey, people ought to be able to get this money back. So it would be kind of a coup for us to implement what looks like a QD MMT, um, but, you know, obviously is refundable on the US side, right? Um, the other thing that goes on with this is it does apply a 15% minimum tax um, to the earnings of foreign subsidiaries. There's an inclusion regime, right, where you pick up the U.S. company's pro rata share of those earnings, and then you get a foreign tax credit against it. So it feels like a backstop to guilty a little bit, right, to kind of bring us up to 15% on, on that front. And so um, a lot of differences but boy, it, it just kind of complicates this analysis of in the context of Pillar 2, when you examine the U.S. system, really how close is it in operation to what Pillar 2 is trying to achieve? And what are the key things that would have to be fixed to make everybody happy that the U.S. was kind of on board with our commitment to adopting Pillar 2? Because like I said, you know, we might be in a situation where we can't do much. No matter how much everybody, no matter how much the administration wants to support it, if we can't pass legislation, it's worth a conversation about whether when you put guilty and this minimum tax and our beat system and you put it in, how far are we away really? And are there arguments to be made that maybe we could be compliant, um, you know, with minimal changes, which would I think make a deal easier. Yeah, thanks. We might come back to some of that. But yeah, I mean, there's just so much complexity now. And some of it just feels like it's unnecessary. We could get to where we want to collectively without it, but we have it. And so we might come back to, to some of that. Christina, maybe just moving on to the EU side of it. I can remember we spoke at the start of this year and you said to me, look, the main concern in Germany was whether we could have a hot, somebody could have a hot shower this winter and it wasn't getting pillar two over the line. But notwithstanding that comment, here we are, Germany has been one of the, the first adopters of it. So I suppose the question for me is, 
were you surprised at that? And look, we've seen other EU countries as well move ahead with it. Do you think that's going to become the norm and more and more EU countries, regardless of what happens in terms of unanimity and, and Hungary, whether that whether Hungary's on board or not, that we're just going to see it more and more with, with other EU countries that haven't yet come on board? Yeah, hi, Peter. So, thanks for the question. It's uh, Yeah, it was to some extent a surprise because Germany before always announced that we are that we would like to do something on the EU uh, level and not on a standalone level. That was also based on our uh, idea that we could not have with digital taxes. You know that other European countries introduced already digital taxes. Germany did not because we always announced, no, we would like to focus on the pillar one and pillar two idea and would like to get that done on an uh, EU a common basis. So then the whole political discussion started and I mean, we still have, and we had just had yesterday the uh, last ECOFIN uh, meeting, where again, Pillar 2 was not on the agenda, so still uh, a pending situation on EU level. And I think within the summertime, it was to some extent at the German government level that they said, okay, there are so many other discussions going around, uh, not about Pillar 2, um, but we said to the people, we will introduce a global minimum tax so we have to do something and this is why they then announced in september okay we do pillar two even on a unilateral basis so at this point in time it was a surprise um now a couple of months later we are um in the situation that the government is quite clear uh, and thus we will move on with that um and we will uh, introduce pillar two with effect as of 2024 uh, and if others don't follow us, um, yeah, that's the case. But I think the hope is still that there is some consensus being reached at some point in time on EU level, because if we don't get an EU directive, there are a lot of open legal questions uh, regarding Pillar 2 from a domestic legal perspective. So what I understand from the authorities is um, there is still hope uh, to, to reach EU consensus. Yeah, thanks, Christine. I think you mentioned the European meeting yesterday, and it was interesting that it did get taken off the agenda, and maybe some comment. There were some comments around it, and maybe we were close to a breakthrough. So we we might hear something on that in terms of getting Hungary over the line in due course. Thanks, Christine. I will get some other European perspectives as well. But I want to jump to Jay to you and your first Christine. Christine, maybe talk about what's happened in Germany. It's we've seen the draft legislation there. India obviously signed up to to pillar two along with many other countries. Where are you at from a legislative perspective in India? Thanks, Peter. I think uh, India has overall been uh, quite uh, proactive in adopting most of the international changes on the PEPS section plan. Uh, having said that, there is still no official announcement on the Pillar 2 changes. Uh, India is, of course, looking forward to uh, Pillar 1 being more important for India, given that India has already introduced the digital tax, uh, both on the equalization levy and the special, uh, you know, the significant economic presence. Having said that, uh, I think from an overall perspective, the conceptually India should stand to gain in the event the pillar two is amended or uh, introduced in the domestic law. Given that the headline corporate tax of India is above 15% in most of the cases, uh, even considering the, uh, the lower tax rate of 15% given to new manufacturing companies, and given that India has got a strong source-based taxation, it should stand to likely to gain out of the pillar two amendments. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, right now it's a wait and watch uh, what we are likely to see. Uh, hopefully now that India has taken up the precedence in the G20, uh, maybe there is some acceleration, there is some uh, you know uh, expediting on this point, but we'll get to see in the coming couple of years whether India is how proactively adopting the changes on the pillar two. Okay, so it's, it's a wait and see as you say, but we, we expect to see something. That, that, that's right. interesting. Um, thanks, Sujay. And maybe jumping to you, Matt, in the UK, not in the EU, but one of the earliest adopters of, of Pillar 2. Um, you might just talk about that process in the UK. And you made the comment to me that, look, it might be some time before anybody's writing checks to, to revenue as a result of Pillar 2. But maybe from a financial statements perspective, there's something more pressing for companies mm. to think about. Yeah, c correct. And I, I suppose uh, we've certainly been an early adopter. There's some worry this year that we might be the only adopter. And of course, there's, there's some pros and cons of that, isn't there? I think that the, the UK has been at the forefront of the discussions and it's obtained a lot of benefit from that in terms of 
public perception that the UK is tackling VEPs and, and furthering that agenda. Um, it's also been able to take a real leading role in those discussions, shaping the legislation with, with UK groups in mind, with our stakeholders in mind. Um, we've also, because of the lead time, been able to carry out quite an extensive consultation process. We've had one consultation on the legislation itself. We've then had draft law released with comments. We've now had a second consultation on some of the technical aspects of the law. So UK-based stakeholders have had quite a considerable lead time to feed in with, with comments, with suggested improvements, with clarifications as to how this works. And obviously, if you're a UK-headed group, you've also got some clarity on how Pillar is going to apply for you if the UK is the earliest adopter, right? You don't have to think about multiple um, top-up taxes in other jurisdictions or, or UTPR concerns. But um, that, that's the kind of the advantages of the UK being an early mover. Of course, there are some disadvantages if the UK is the only mover um, or, or the very first. And so we have already pushed implementation of Pillar 2 back from April to December 2023 um, and noting that, that UK businesses would be at a competitive and administrative disadvantage if we were the only early mover. Um, we seem quite set on accounting periods commencing on or after the end of 2023, which for, for calendar year groups means 2024 is the year. I, I think I'd be surprised to see a further delay and it's helpful to hear from Christina that, that 2024 might be the year for others as well. But I think that there is some concern, of course, that if the UK is the only mover, then that could lead to businesses wanting to structure out of the UK if they can, or UK headed businesses being at that disadvantage in terms of the the admin, the data collection, and potentially the top up taxes that are payable that aren't payable in other places. Um, but it, it, in terms of readiness, Peter, absolutely, if 2024 is your first year, then your reporting and your payments of, of any top up tax are not going to be due till 2025. But if our legislation passes in the spring summer of next year, which it, it looks like it would be receiving substantive enactment in, in the finance bill in summer 23, then it means c companies will, will need to have a view from an accounting perspective and, and a deferred tax perspective when they publish accounts later next year, which obviously is, is much sooner. Yeah, it is quite imminent. And yeah, and certainly in Ireland, Matt, we looked at the UK as an early adopter. We saw others doing the same. And certainly the view in Ireland is that we will adopt as well, regardless of, of unanimity in the EU. We don't want to give up tax revenue, so it would, it would make perfect sense for us to follow, uh, as you did. Um, and another country, obviously, looking at you, Jakob, that followed the UK, as Matt described, and brought in draft legislation as well, is the Netherlands. Do you want to just talk us through the, the thinking in the Netherlands and, and maybe... You know, we, we talked last week around the complexity around the new rules and what this might mean. It might even be disproportionate to, to the revenues that, that it might raise. It. How, how has implementation or how is it going in the Netherlands? Yeah, at the moment, um, yeah, we have this consultation law. Um, so there's going to be a lot of um, reactions from all kind of parties on this. And first of all, what you see is the incredible complexity. So, um, First, Pillar 2 was somewhere in the air, but that now it's dropped and uh, everybody's more aware that it's going to be incredible complex and it's going to be a lot of work and a lot of cost. So that worries a lot of companies and tax directors how to do this. Um, and is um, 2024 um, not too short? So that, that's really a concern at the moment. Um, so it's complex. Um, and the other thing is called Netherlands is a first mover. Um, and there's also a lot of worries about how to deal with that, for example, with the relation with the US. Um, so is the Netherlands really going to tax, uh, for example, guilty? Um, well, nobody believes that. So there's also a lot of, uh, well, what's go going to happen? Is it, is it really true that, that we get these kinds of taxation? And what does it mean then in practice? On the other hand, as long as the EU is not, well, implementing, that means that there is always a danger that there's going to be a lot of uh, definitions in this law. There will be a lot of in, uh, interpretation differences too between these countries. So um, in principle, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of uncertainty how to deal with it as long as we don't have an EU uh, yeah, one line on this and that only a few countries will adopt this. Yeah, th thanks, Jacob. And you, and you talk about the, 
the complexity that's undoubtedly there. And Christina, we talked about it last week as well. And you don't want to get too bogged down in what ifs. We, we are where we are, but it is very complicated. And we talked about other ways in terms of, you know, could it be simpler if we just all agreed to bring in a domestic minimum tax of 15%? Could we avoid a lot of what we now have? I mean, do you think the ship has sailed on that? You know, it's too late. We are for the foreseeable future going to be looking at that level of complexity. If you ask me, uh -huh. I, I think, uh, you know, Germany um, is one of these countries, once we announce something, I, I think we go for that. Uh, nonetheless, there's potentially some kind of hope because I just received a, a press statement of one of our estates. Um, and the view is uh, in opposite to the German federal government that if we go ahead on a more or less standalone basis or with only four or five countries uh, following us, um, that that is a huge disadvantage for uh, German businesses. And uh, therefore, there are concerns that if we move on, um, we at the end uh, just trigger additional costs. And as Jacob mentioned, it is uh, absolutely high complex. Um, and so potentially, uh, there's, uh, again, a political discussion going uh, on, because at the end, you need also uh, approval of the German states to introduce the law. But as of today, I would still believe that, that we go for pillar two, uh, although at the end, we have to admit, at least from a German perspective, we do not expect uh, substantial uh, tax revenues. Um, because as you said, at least what, what other countries will do, make sure that they have a working domestic minimum tax. So at the end, um, there should be not top of tax left uh, for countries like Germany. Yeah, agree, Christina. I think this is hugely political, and I would equally query some of the tax raising forecasts that, that have been put out there. But I think this is a juggernaut we're going to struggle to, to stop. D David, if I might come back to you just on the comment around um, Pillar One, and certainly in Ireland and some other countries, it's, it's civil servants, public servants who do a lot of the batting for a country. The US signed up to Pillar One or to Pillar Two. Uh, and now we're seeing an issue, big issue, getting it over, over the line in the US, which sort of is a surprise to, to many others. Um, can you just explain that? Like, what are, maybe again with your crystal ball, I mean, and you touched on it, I mean, what is the likelihood of the US getting something Pillar 2 compliant as it, as it has signed up to over the line, given the split houses? Yeah, well, let's take a step back real quick. So just to be fair, as far as enacting stuff, the U.S. has done far more to combat pockets of low tax profits with the guilty law than anybody's been able to actually enact, right? Guilty is far closer to a pillar two regime than anybody's kind of brought online. Um, and I think there's also, there's some strong arguments to be made, just, just real quick. So we know that guilty is not at 15%. It's at like 13.125%. Now, I agree. Everybody said 15%. Maybe it needs to be tweaked. Remember, guilty is determined by reference to our corporate tax rate, right? So the guilty rate would go up if the corporate tax rate went up a few points. And I think for all the reasons Vikas brought up at the beginning of the call, it's possible our corporate rate could go up in the future, which would bring the guilty rate up. Um, it applies to everybody, not just $750 million companies and up. Everybody pays guilty in the United States, including individuals can have guilty inclusions. I mean, it's, it's a much broader tax that aims to, to knock out low tax profits. Um, and there's also right the, this blending issue where we can offset excess credits from one country against low tax income from another country. And I do think that needs to be fixed, right? That's a fundamental flaw of the guilty system. It allows US companies that do have low tax profits to, to um, you know, move forward. So here's what I think, right? I think we, we need to, if companies are going to go ahead and, and, and enact, let's say that Christina and Germany move ahead. Not that you represent Germany, Christina, but you know what I mean. Um, a call is going to have to be made if you've got a U.S. sub in there and that U.S. sub applies guilty. Is that a qualified CFC tax in OECD parlance? And if it is, can you allocate it out to the sub that got taxed under the guilty system and count it as a credit for the Pillar 2 tax up at the German level? There's a way to make this work. If guilty went first, it was a qualified CFC tax and you could allocate it out. To the extent the U.S. caught any tax in the guilty system, you know, Germany would have to give a credit. Nobody's going to like that answer, but it positions the U.S. to say, hey, look, if we tweak this to make it country by country, you guys give us a qualified CFC regime, 
maybe we can all work together on this. But the implicit understanding is the U.S. is going to collect first with the guilty regime, right? So, you know, that's why I say I, I'm not sure we're, you know, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get anything done, but I'm not sure we're done having the discussion about, you know, if what we've done is enough, right? And I say this a little bit because I'm on with my international friends and, you know, I'd love to, to kind of bait some de debate on this. I believe we should amend, but if we can't, I think we have to take a real hard look at how close are we and can we come to agreement on some of these systems to make sure that they at least operate in a rational way in sync. Well, I think we, yeah, it's an, I think we have to be pragmatic. Nobody wants double time. So I think we have to be pragmatic and we need to collectively find a solution and if the solution isn't there, maybe it's somewhere else. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's almost a tribute. It sort of surprises me, David, in the US, your politicians really get stuck into what are quite tax techie, nerdy detail. I don't think that would happen in every other country. So you can take some credit. You can take some credit, David. Uh, <laughs> they have a lot of people helping them understand, Peter. I'll tell you that. Yeah, but they take the time to to do to understand it. quite detailed stuff. Um, I might just jump on to briefly. I'm not going to spend too long on, on the interest limitation rules, but just going to bring it up because look, we're in an environment of of, of increasing interest rates. Um, and Jakob, I might just jump to you because. The Netherlands has brought in interest limitation rules in, in line with ATAD, I think, back in 2020. You know, is it something you're seeing taxpayer clients interested in or in an environment of increasing rates? Do you think revenue authorities are going to take more of an interest in interest limitation rules? Absolutely. So what you see is uh, the rule kicked in, and it means that, uh, that our clients were really thinking about how to do the financing. So first, that was a big issue. Um, so we have seen a lot of restructuring. Um, also, we've seen that um, raising the EBITDA um, is some of the solutions which has been done. Um, um, so there have been a few things how companies reacted on that. Um, and of course, um, yeah, how to finance is also uh, more, will I do more in equity or do we do more in debt? So that still is, is absolutely an issue um, at the moment. Um, but yeah, um, everybody's now more aware of the whole situation. So that mm -hmm. means when you come in these kinds of situations, you may are making the distinguishment whether or not how to do it. So it's more yeah. into the system now and, and well, companies have to deal with it as they have to do it. Yeah. CJ, just jumping to India, um, interest limitation rules, how much of an issue is it in India? And do you see it being an increasingly an issue of focus for the Indian authorities? So again, India had adopted interest, uh, interest limitation loan in 2017. Uh, again, you know, in line with the action plan four of the BEPS, uh, uh, you know, the declaration. So really the 30% EBITDA rule is what is applied. Interestingly, in, India also gives you a carry forward of the excess interest, which is not allowed for a period of eight years. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in terms of issues, uh, this is still, uh, not come under too much of litigation so far as in the compliance, but there are issues in terms of the interpretation of the rules and to practical situations. Uh, one of the issues which is coming up is that while the Indian, uh, the borrower is not giving the deduction because of the limitations, the interest is still taxable in the hands of the, the foreign associated enterprise on a full basis. So it brings in that mismatch between the deductibility and the taxability in the hands of the recipient. And in case the Indian uh, borrower is unable to carry forward, I mean, basically carry forward and still not take the full deduction. So it's almost brings a permanent difference in that sense. And there are so, I think even on the competition of the EBITDA amounts, there are certain issues which you are seeing. But I mean, we have not seen so much of, uh, you know, uh, litigation or issues coming on the tax office front or the revenues really challenging it. But maybe in the coming years, we'll definitely see some uh, movements on that. Thanks, CJ. And that certainly has potential for some penal treatment um, if, you, if you're right. caught up in that, which is interesting. Uh, just a reminder to, to participants to please do pop questions into the into the Q&A. We've had a couple already, which which we can come to. Um, and look, the focus of this webinar is principally um, Pillar 2, but, but pillar, pillar 1 is still out there. And I might just jump to that. And we know, if we touched on it earlier, we know many countries have introduced their own digital taxes. And I might, Matt, just jump to you 
has been in a country which has introduced a, a digital tax, and I believe it has raised, you know, maybe more revenues than we're expected. How do you see this playing out in terms of pillar one and, and, and digital taxes, unilateral digital taxes? Yeah, interesting question. So, that, I mean, the, the UK is committed to repeal the, the DST upon implementation of Pillar 1. I suppose efforts have been so focused on Pillar 2, haven't they, for, for the last 12 or 18 months that that still feels like something that's not coming down the line very soon. Um, the, the UK DST ha has raised revenues. I suppose it is also very specific, right? So there's um, a high revenue threshold from a global and a UK perspective in there in relation to the digital activity. It also specifically only targets a search engine, a social media platform and an online intermediary. So some of the other DSTs that we see that are much broader and, and target online or other kind of digital activities, the UK DST is not. Um, it's, it's quite easy to think about the, the US technology companies out here in California that that was designed in order to collect some more tax revenues from. So it's been very targeted and specific. Um, it does raise some revenues, but as I say, I think upon pillar one implementation, when we get there, the plan is for that to go away. Thank you, Matt. I might just jump around. Christine, any plans in Germany, the digital taxes front? No, I mean, currently everybody, literally at the German Federal Minister of Finance is working on the pillar two legislation. And um, pillar one um, has, has, has not gone away, I would say, but at least there's no pressure on that. And uh, it will be uh, a quite difficult way to get to pillar two. Um, so I think currently uh, with regard to pillar one, the discussions are uh, going a bit on in the background, but um, nothing to be expected. And I don't believe in, in 2023. And yeah. I mean, how should Pillar One work without the US? I mean, honestly, yeah. th that is something. Um, I mean, Pillar Two triggers a lot of questions. How does it work if only five or 10 countries in the world start with that? But with Pillar One, that's even more difficult. Um, and I mean, from a German perspective, of course, we would like to, as every other country, we would like to see additional revenues, um, but there are only two or four uh, German large groups potentially being affected by Pillar 1. So I don't see that Germany works currently uh, in detail on, on further Pillar 1 ideas. Yeah, that's certainly what we would see in Ireland as well. And maybe the danger is that the pillar one threshold comes down, countries see other countries raising yeah. revenues and things change. But that's certainly the, the way we would see it. And Jakob, any difference in the, in the Netherlands? So you see it? No, it's, it's the same as it's in Germany. So it's not at the yeah. moment on the radar. There's so much yeah. to do um, with pillar two. So it, it's not on the radar. Yeah. So Jay Here, it can I jump in just real quick and make a comment um, that's apropos to the you know kind of proliferation of digital taxes? So, for U.S.-based multinationals, it used to be that um, you know if if a tax got imposed on some income outside the United States, you could potentially get a credit in the United States, meaning you're not out of pocket, right, on the imposition of a digital tax. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was so politically offensive for people to adopt a digital tax because it was a direct revenue grab on US multinationals, like Matt said, specifically mm -hmm. a couple of companies out on the West Coast. So what's, what's happened behind the scenes over the last two years is the, the Department of Treasury has written foreign tax credit regulations that have gutted, gutted the foreign tax creditability of these unilateral digital taxes. And they've been focused on how the tax is imposed, why it's imposed, whether or not the, that the US company has the correct connection. And it's clear that if you don't have a, a connection through property or source or attribution, that, that you know, these taxes could become not creditable in the United States. So, We've, the political landscapes now move from a place where the U.S. has protected themselves. They're not going to give you a credit for this stuff. Um, but the cost has shifted to, to taxpayers, right? Because they're going to get semi-double tax. Presumably, you can get a deduction in the U.S., but that's of little solace, right, when you're being taxed on income in another country. So I just want to point that out, that there is this difference now where taxpayers are kind of at higher risk in the U.S., than they were when the unilateral digital taxes were kind of proliferating. It was the US coffers that were getting emptied at that point. But the government has played some nice cards here to shift that risk to the taxpayer. Yeah, and I think many other countries have done exactly the same, David. Ireland certainly has done the same. It's not credible. 
creditable. It's a, it's you know it's available as a deduction, but that's not worth an awful lot, particularly in a, in a low tax rate environment. Um, thanks, Dave, for that. Suja, any quick comment from India on digital taxes? Yeah, I think on digital, so uh, digital tax India has already introduced the equalization levy, and I think uh, post that there was a uh, there was a declaration with the government that if pillar one is adopted before 31st of March 2024. India will then not stop uh, levying the digital service tax declaration levy after that. And within this two year period, they will actually provide a credit for the taxes already credit, you know, collected as the equalization levy. So as a concept, equalization levy in India applies to both uh, digital advertising companies as well as for e-commerce companies. And again, you know, it's said uh, by structure, it is not creditable uh, because it's not uh, under the treaty, it is levied under a different law. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think, again, it will all depend on whether Pillar 1 comes into there. I think the other interesting point from India is that the threshold of Pillar 1 is pretty high. Uh, and equalization levy and the, uh, the thresholds for the local levy and equalization levy is pretty low. So the question that comes in is that even after Pillar 1 is brought in, how will India do, uh, you know, whether the India will actually abolish equalization levy on all the companies or only the companies which are going to get covered by Pillar 1? And in what form and manner it will continue for the other companies? So I think these are interesting things to be looked at. I think we have to wait and wait till March 24 to see what the uh, really outcome is. Another another way to see. Um, and I'm just going to jump. Thanks, thanks, Uj, for that. Uh, we're coming towards the end. Just one last question. I promise I'm not a plant, but it is close to my heart. The 15% rate. Just a really quick around the room. Um, is that a fixed rate? 15%. Does anybody think that might increase within the next? I'm going to say seven to ten years. Christina. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I don't think either. No. Because I, I, I'll be different. Yeah, I can see that happening, Peter. You know, give us give us five years, give us global implementation of Pillar Two. The tax authority is very happy with the approach, and another recession, another need to raise revenues. I can quite easily see a discussion around. You know, fifteen should become eighteen, should become twenty. Yeah, I, I, Peter, let me jump in on this. Uh, uh, what we are hearing from uh, different stakeholders is that 15% uh, may remain 15% or as Matt said, 20%. But there could be certain additional levies which could come in. For example, many countries have started levying some quick taxes on the uh, on the fuel charges, etc. So there could be certain other levies uh, which may crop up in order to fill in the coffers now. Agreed. I, I think there is a risk. I think it undermines the credibility of the OECD if it comes in too quickly, but I think after a certain period of time that there, there is that risk. And yeah, if, this, if it's going to raise more revenues and there's a recession, then it becomes a, a possibility. Look, we're, we're, we're very close to time. So thanks a million to, to all of the, the panelists for the contributions. Thanks for everybody for, for joining today. Clearly a lot going on. I don't think there's, there's any doubt that uh, Pillar 2 is with us. We have a minimum tax, and, and I don't think that there, there's any stopping that. Lots of uncertainty. Uh, question, that's, that's a theme from today as well. Lots more to come. We didn't even get to talk about EU's BFIT proposal, so there's lots more out there, which I think is, is material for, for next webinar. So, look, thanks again to everybody, and hopefully you all get to enjoy a well-earned break of the holiday season. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.